Hiromini and Rack by G. Bramwell Evans Give me the clear blue sky over my head and the green turf beneath my feet, a winding road before me, and then to thinking. Chapter 3 On Hiding Things April How different the woods are in spring from winter! I do not mean that they appear so different, but feel different. Only a few months ago there was the sense of damp deadness. Now there is the thrill of vibrant life. Where the rotting leaves lay sombre and dull, today the spikes of the bluebells are pushing upward, and the little wood anemones shiver with delighted ecstasy. Even the barks of the trees look fresh. The silver birch shimmers in the April sun whilst the trunks of the great beech trees look sleek, well-groomed, and, in certain lights, are touched with a sheen of silver and pale lavender. I found Rack interested in something which lay buried in the mould. It was a hen which lay completely covered, save for a feather or two which swayed in the light breeze. Now, what's done that? I said to the dog, and I noticed that he was casting around for some tell-tale scent. He found it and knew what it was, for the hair round his throat was slightly raised, which boded ill for the owner of the trail. "'What is it?' I asked of the dog, as he looked at me with intelligent eyes. "'A fox, I should say,' said a deep voice behind me, and rather startled by the suddenness of it, I turned and saw Jerry. "'You did give me a start,' said I. "'Neither I nor the dog knew you were about.' The old poacher laughed at this tribute to his quietness of movement. That's the work of a fox, he said. Or a cat that's taken to the woods, I suggested. Jerry shook his head. As a rule, a cat don't bury and leave telltale traces of his work like them feathers sticking out, and he don't scratch a hole like that generally. An old Tom covers anything he wants to hide rather than berries. Pull over it moss and leaves, but don't dig a grave. Leastways, that's my experience of him. But I thought a fox would be too cunning to leave such traces of his foraging, I said. Nope, answered my friend. That's the funny part of it. He's cunning enough to find an entrance into a foul house, and fool enough to let his larder betray him. Funny how most criminals, they tell me, others leave him a clue of some sort, which shows up their stupidness rather than their smartness. As we passed on together through the wood, I asked what he had been doing, and for answer he pulled out of his capacious inner pocket a half a dozen good-sized trout. And were they rising well, I asked, knowing the weather to be on the cold side, and the hatch of flies to be rather scant. Only when I made them, he said with a chuckle. I bought them out of their hiding places right enough. And where's your tackle, rod and line, I asked severely. Here, he said gaily, rolling back his sleeve and displaying a discoloured arm with hand and fingers working dexterously. You've been tickling them then, I asked. He nodded. Old Nancy Fairbairn up yonder, her that's been so bad with rheumatics, said she fancied a nice fresh trout. So I browned me arm with mud and went down to the beck where it meets the river and guddled for them. Is it easy to get them like that, I asked. Easy as eating butter, he said. If you only know how, you work em under a big stone or overhanging bank, then down goes your arm and you feel for em with your fingers. Out with em. And how do you know when to grip them, I asked. You tickle em until you hear em laugh, said the old vagabond joyously. Or snore, he added, giving me a poke somewhere in the region of my ribs. Near the edge of the wood, the dog chased a squirrel which leapt for safety up the trunk of a pine. I called him to heel, whilst I craned my neck upwards to see whether I could locate him in the topmost branches. He ain't there, whispered Jerry, pointing towards the high branches. How do you know, I asked. Can you see him? Jerry shook his head. Follow the lead of your dog's nose and you'll find that he's only about four foot up the trunk on the side furthest from us. He knows you'll be looking for him high up, so he keeps low down. They always do. Jerry moved cautiously a few feet to my right, and immediately bright eyes sped up the tree to the nearest fork. 
Here he chattered at us and hurled down every epithet of abuse for disturbing his search for a morning meal. His language is quite squirreligious, said Jerry with a grin, and it was my turn this time to poke him in the ribs for making such an outrageous pun. Let's sit down and watch him for a few minutes, said he. But come here first, and pointing at the fork of a big holly bush, he added, I'll wager anything you like that that's where the little beggar's dray is. Dray, I repeated. Nest, my friend interpreted. And so we sat down some distance from the pine from which the squirrel still looked down on us and waited for him to reveal himself further. As we sat there quietly, Jerry talked in low tones. That there fox we was talking about just now has something in common with your little bushy tail. Yes, I said, so hesitatingly that my friend knew that it was an invitation to explain further. The squirrel hides things too, but not in the same way as the fox. And though he doesn't kill birds and bury them carelessly, he's just as haphazard in what he does bury. You're referring to his habit of laying up store for the winter and then hibernating? I suggested. Well, said my friend, in a way, yes. But first of all, don't run away with the idea that a squirrel hibernates. He doesn't. Though that's what the books will tell you. He certainly has more than 40 winks in winter, but I've seen him scampering about the trees when there's been a foot of snow on the ground. But he lays up stores of food for himself. I found them, I persisted. It's not the stores what he hides that I'm thinking on, said Jerry. But if you're watching when the nuts, hazel and acorn is ripe, then you'll see him dart to some bank or trip over some barren bit of ground and after scraping a hole, shoves a nut in. Then he carefully scrats and covers it. He'll do dozens and dozens like that. Jerry indicated how the little chap carried the nut by putting his own tongue in the side of his cheek. This is his pouch, he explained. And he can remember all these hidden and separate treasures, I asked. Not him, said Jerry decisively. That's my point. Where the fox is careless in his hiding, old Bushy Tail is forgetful in his buryings. And the result? Here the old poacher turned to me for the answer. He has to fall back on his main store, I answered. That's not the answer I wanted, said Jerry. The result is a far bigger thing than merely filling the squirrel's insides. The result is, and here he paused to emphasise his remark, an even more beautiful world. To say that I was perplexed is putting it mildly. However can the productions of beauty be linked with a squirrel's forgetfulness? So ran my thoughts, and Jerry simply watched me, laughing in his own hearty way. Seeing that I could not answer his riddle, he said, Well now, what happens to the forgotten nut or hidden seed? Jerry answered his own question. Nature doesn't forget it. Mother Earth holds it in her arms, and the rain in due course softens it, and the sun kisses it into new life. And lo, where no tree grew, up comes the oak, the beech, and the hazel. The squirrel has become one of God's unpaid gardeners. He's an unknowing sower of beauty. And so it's a good thing to have a bad memory sometimes, eh? A few minutes later, our little friend in the pine fork had lost a good deal of his shyness. He treated us to a wonderful display of gymnastics. Along a strong branch he raced. Without any hesitation, he launched himself onto a gracefully drooping beach. Under his weight, the branch hardly swayed, and so perfect was the jump that the little gymnast hardly seemed to pause in his stride. On the beech tree he found another squirrel, which we had not seen. Evidently the second one had been watching us, and the first squirrel had spotted him, and as soon as he had recovered his pluck, had sprung to meet him. Up and down they sped. Sometimes they seemed to close in combat. Sometimes I thought it was but a game of chase. He's driving him out of his own territory, said Jerry to me. That second fellow has no right in that there tree, and he knows it. So the squirrels, as well as the birds, stake out their claim to certain trees, do they? I asked. Jerry nodded. The second chap, he'll have a selected tree or two, which he marks private, no road. And a tween is the little park, and our first friends, they'll be a sort of no man's land, where very often the two of them will fraternise and pass the time of day, and even play. But it's war if one swings onto the bow claimed by another. As I walked homeward, I kept thinking of the squirrel that rushed its neighbour out of its own domain. It would not have harmed the little beggar to have allowed him to stay. 
Everywhere in the world there seems to be this claim for private property. There is little sharing. All are out to hold what they have got. Possibly the newcomer might have been a raider and might have robbed his neighbour of a store of nuts and acorns. Therefore he had to be headed off. The squirrel claims his tree. The thrush and robin guard their gardens. The big trout holds his favourite position in the river against all comers. Even the dipper preserves her part of the stream and the otter allows no intruders. But what they guard is their food supply, their vital necessities. Then I looked up at a beautiful wood and on it was, Trespassers will be prosecuted. But that was put up by a landowner. The squirrel's instincts have evidently been handed down to us.